Hi guys, it's Darlene with Featherweight Doctor. I hope everybody is doing great today. It's Monday and uh, it's beautiful here in Redmond, Washington. And I thought I would, let me just make sure that um, I am on Facebook. I hope everyone is doing great. Hang on one sec here. Let me just refresh. So you may notice that I have my lab coat on today. It's because Mondays are Ask the Doctor. So, hi Linda Wood from Facebook. So we are going to discuss, um, and Becky, hi Becky. We are going to discuss some <clears throat> interesting topics today. I had some questions come in over social media and I thought we would, uh, <laughs> Deb, Deb Allen Sinclair goes Facebook here. <laughs> I thought we would talk about um, the different face plates that come on your featherweight, what they might mean. And then, of course, uh, the school bell question that came in. So I think the call sign for Insta was DB Debs. Um, she asked me about what year the penguin walking foot was produced in and what year the school bells were produced in. So some of that may uh, make sense to you and some of it may not make any sense to you. So let's discuss, hi Rose from Tennessee, uh, what, uh, what that all means. So <clears throat> the school bell is a type of featherweight. It was actually a year of featherweight that, that featherweights were specifically made. They are part of the original cast aluminum machines that were produced in 33 first production run in 33 and then also in 34. The reason why they're so sought after is because they were made in very few quantities and then shortly after 34, Singer actually recast the whole machine to get rid of the notch that the school bell, the school bell by the way is the actual bobbin winder that sits on the front of the machine versus sitting on the top decking of the machine. So let me show you what that looks like. If you are ever out and about and you see I have many machines in front of me there and you ever see a machine with this chrome corner on it you know you are dealing with something extremely old so this is my personal machine um, her name is Mary and she is a first production run 34 I unfortunately do not have a 33 in my collection someday I will have it um, but not right now. Hi, Mary, Susie, and Mom, and Carol Smith. How's everybody doing? Um, so, so the school bells were specifically produced in 33 and 34. Over the course of 34 to 35, they did change out the aluminum. They changed out to a black front-facing school bell and then eventually got rid of the notch altogether. Report a different cast, which means that it's a solid front with the button bobbin winder sitting on on the top decking. So that's what I know about the school bell. Or yeah, with the school bell. The other thing that she asked about was the penguin walking foot. This is a, another one of my, hi Bridget, hi Bonnie, Melanie. Uh, this is one of my personal um, collection items. It's an extremely rare and collectible walking foot. This is what the box looks like. So if you ever are out and about, and you see this little box, grab it, it's, it's valuable. Um, I see them selling anywhere from $1,000 and up. Um, it's, it's, the reason why it's called the penguin is because it looks like a little penguin walking along, waddling around as it's moving your layers of fabric through. Look how cute she is. So who would have thought this little thing is it worth $1,000? Um, I actually was unable to locate any information whatsoever as to when these little guys were produced. I'm going to keep digging. I've got some resource manuals in my, um, my library. Hi, Nancy. Um, and I'm going to keep looking because I, I like the fact that, um, my Instagram follower kind of stumped me. So my, my goal is to find out not only when these were produced, but how many were produced. I thought that would be kind of an interesting, uh, number to have also. So anyway, that's the walking foot, and then we've also talked about the school bell. 
I also thought it would be kind of fun today. Um, there are to let you guys know that there are four different face plates that are on the featherweights, and the face plates were um, significant because you can very quickly and easily, from a visual inspection, figure out when your machine was made, or at least the era that it was made in. So a lot of people don't know this, but there was actually two different scroll face plates. So the first one was put on the school bell era, um, the earlier models of featherweights, and then there was a secondary school, uh, scroll face created. I am not sure of why the change, but they were, and there's a really easy way of telling the difference. Let me show you. Take Mary's faceplate off here. Ooh. So, this is Mary's faceplate, and I don't know if you guys can see this really well, but there's kind of a Celtic y design around the outer edge of this. The easiest way to tell right off the bat whether you're dealing with a really early faceplate or a later scroll faceplate is you see the thread guide here. It's shiny, it doesn't have any engraving on it whatsoever. And there also is missing the little pluses in the four corners of the face plate. So this is an early, um, an early scroll face, probably on the 33s, 34s, potentially the 35s. And then for some reason, I don't know why, again, that might be interesting to do a little digging on, they changed over to this faceplate. And you can see on here the very distinct difference. You see the thread guide, it does have engraving on it. So that's your first obvious difference. And then the other part is that there's little pluses or crosses in the four corners. And so this is a later scroll faceplate. They use these until 45. And then in 45, they shut down productions to convert the metal making factories into ammunition depots so they could make weapons and bullets and hand grenades and handguns for the war effort. And when they came back up, they switched to, they called it the modern retro faceplate. Now it is not uncommon to find a machine post-war that has this linear faceplate on it, especially if it came out of the UK plant. They seem to have a lot more of the scroll face ones left over that they did put on some machines, um, but this linear faceplate was the faceplate that they switched to called the modern retro faceplate. I think it looks like the grill of a car, um, a linear faceplate after the, they came back up from the war. So um, again, these are all really easy ways if you ever see a machine in, like in a locked case or you're at an estate sale to be able to tell very quickly what age and era machine you're dealing with. Obviously the older face plates are, um, are, are more, well people tend to like them because they're kind of blingy. Uh, so that's why a lot of people actually switch out their face plates to the blingier, scrolly ones versus the linear ones. I have a, a 49 right now in the orphanage that has the scroll face plate. I know that scroll face, face plate did not come factory from factory with that face plate. Someone switched it out over the years, and so now I have a really pretty 1949 uh, with the scroll face plate. So there is one more. One more faceplate out there that is much rarer than any of the other ones. It's the faceplate that was on the black side. So the black side is a machine that was made during the moratorium on chrome before they shut down for war efforts to completely change over to the ammunition depot. They created a factory black side in 1941. Um, and there's very few quantities of them. They're highly collectible, especially if you have a complete black side with all of its parts and pieces. The reason why the black or the face or the the black side is so collectible is because there's very little chrome on the machine. And so if you're lucky enough to have one, it probably has black presser feet instead of chrome presser feet. It has black bobbins. 
And this little guy right here is the number one indicator that you have a factory black side on your hands. This is not dirty. It does not need to be polished. This is a black scroll faceplate. Isn't that cool? If you can f even find a faceplate, a faceplate, I've seen them sell for as much as a thousand dollars on eBay. Isn't that crazy? Um, so this one goes on our factory black side that we purchased accidentally uh, in our first year of business. And I say accidentally because uh, we didn't know we were purchasing it. It was from an online auction in Florida. We used several different auction houses when we we're sourcing machines and they had taken a picture of the back of the machine, which is not as obvious. Um, if I, we would have seen the front, I think it would have gone for a lot more than what we paid for it. Um, but we were happy that it was kind of a happy accident. And now we have a black side in our personal collection. So those are the different face plates, even the 222, which is the free arm convertible that was made in the UK, has the serrated um, modern um, retro face plate on it. It doesn't have its own special face plate. But I wanted you guys to see what these items look like so that way when you're out and about in your sourcing, you can find them more easily and be able to identify the age and era of them. I have to tell you guys a quick story before I let you go. There has been this very kind lady, I'm gonna not say her name on here because I'm sure she would get bombarded, but she lives in Colorado and she is a new collector um, to, of featherweight machines and her very first collectible machine purchase was the um, San Francisco Bay, nope. Yeah, San Francisco Bay, uh, de uh, special badge machine, which is probably, other than the Chicago World's Fair, the second most collectible featherweight out there. She got a, she saw an ad for a, a lady, an older lady who was selling her three featherweights. She had made charity clothing and doll clothing on them for many decades and she just wanted to further them along because she's not sewing as much anymore. And so this lady showed up not knowing what she had and really not knowing even what she had after she bought it for very little money, I might add. And she got it home and realized what, what gift she was given. And then very shortly after that, within two weeks, this lady needed to go buy a lottery ticket. She was looking at another one and went out and purchased it. And it's the 1933 school bell. For close to nothing. <laughs> I was like, wait, can I just, can you go buy me a lottery ticket? Like to even have an opportunity to buy those two machines in the same lifetime is pretty unheard of. But the fact that she purchased them less than two weeks apart from each other, let's just say for less than $200 each, that lady is clearly lucky when it comes to featherweight hunting so uh she's very kind and she's her and i've been chatting quite a bit about the machines and how to restore them and how to keep them in good or order because she really does have some extremely collectible machines on her hands so anyway i just thought i would give you guys a little hope um i can tell you why i've only been in one of in front of one 1933 and it was someone's great grandmother's machine and i was not obviously going to take a family machine out of the family and so I did not have an opportunity to buy that and I've only ever seen um, a San Francisco Bay badged and it was not in good working order at all but those machines in any condition are still extremely collectible and very valuable so anyway my new friend in Colorado I think you're amazing and I think you are the luckiest featherweight collector I've met in a long time <laughs> So anyway, uh, that was what I had for you today. Today's going to be kind of short and sweet. Um, Wednesday, I'm so excited. I got my quilt as you go sew along information posted on the website this afternoon. For those of you who messaged me over the weekend while we were out of town, I did not get the, I call it quilt plan by number. Uh, it's my continuous line quilting pattern for 
going around the blocks all with one start and one stop. I did not get that done before we left on our little camping trip over the weekend in Eastern Washington, but they were up today. So go ahead and um, put out the, um, go out to the website, click to the middle of the homepage and you'll see journal and blog posts and it's the first post. So the quilting plan for week one is out there now, as well as the quilting plan for the sampler, um, I'm sorry, for the setting block that we're doing each week. So we're doing the same setting block each week and then a new sampler block each week. So as of Wednesday, um, we'll do block two, which all the blocks are named after a city in Arizona. So week one was Pine Top AZ, which we've spent some time in. And this week's block I'm calling Prescott, Arizona. Um, one of my favorite cities in all of Arizona. I would have lived there in a red hot minute. Um, and I kind of say why in the blog post. So um, so that's this week's the quilt, the cutting instructions for week two and the quilt plan by number is posted together on a separate blog post. So that way you guys will have all of the information out of the gate. Um, and it's, it's another really simple pieced block. Hi, Wenda. Hi, Rhonda. So don't, don't get overwhelmed. If you get overwhelmed, just get your cutting done. And then we will assemble the block on Wednesday during my live event. And then we will quilt the block during my live event, event also. On Wednesday so that's at 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time on Facebook Instagram and YouTube if you haven't already go ahead and like these videos and feel free to share them out to your quilting buddies or to your featherweight groups um, the content for the quilt as you go so along is totally free I'm encouraging people to use their stash and not to go purchase new fabric um, I am using a collection of fat quarters from um, the gelato the E.E. E. Shank Gelato Ombre Fabrics for mine, and then just a white on white tonal fabric for my background that I already had. I actually had all of it already. I didn't even buy anything new. So, I, of course, Bridget says, you say Prescott. I live there. It's not Prescott, Arizona. It's Prescott, and Prescott Valley is right next to it. <laughs> so Kathleen Rogers wants to know how many total setting blocks there are. Um... I want to say 18, but let me count them real quick because there's four different ones in there too. Um, so two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. That's not right. One. Oh yeah, go this way. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. I think there is 16, Kathleen, 16 setting blocks and as you can see I moved my color colors around on them a little bit so I have my lighter like sun orange and yellows in the middle and then it gets to light pinks in the next row and then the darker colors are around the outer edge so my color gradation kind of grows up and down kind of radiates up from the middle so that's this all right well um kind of exciting news so Friday I'll be here probably on my deck for the sip and sew Friday night, but but a week from tonight I'm going to be on another camping trip in Deception Pass, which is north of us, and I believe I'm going to have cell coverage at the campsite. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that. So I probably will be doing my Ask the Doctor from the campsite next week. Uh, I also have some pictures I'll be posting throughout the week of our um, of our camp trip this past weekend with our maiden voyage on our new overland trailer and then um I did a bunch of sewing and stuff too so I brought my battery backup system and had a great time sewing by the river so I really appreciate everybody joining me today and that's my schedule for the week if you would like me to address anything during these ask the doctor shows um go ahead and reach out through one of the social media platforms or you can email me at info i n f o at featherweightdoctor.com. Thanks for joining me. I hope everybody has a great Monday. Bye guys.